start because it's already a couple minutes after. Uh, so everyone, mute your uh, mute your uh, audio, not audio, your um, microphone. Oh wait, hold on. Ying Zheng is just connecting, so make sure that he or she can hear me. Okay, while we're doing that, I am going to. Most of you have actually heard this. I've already given my YouTube spiel, but I'll do it very quickly. And so, hold on. how do I do your screen? I want my webinar. Okay, you can see this. This is good. Uh, okay, so I will go back and forth in these, sorry, on these issues as we talk about them. But I'm not going to stick to the PowerPoint because it's a little bit boring. It has all the information, but really, it's a bit boring. Okay, so um, let's talk about what this program is all about. I, I know some of you have already heard this, but Give me two minutes to explain to those who haven't yet. This is a program about understanding why there are conflicts around the world. And by conflicts, we're talking about conflicts between groups, between collectives, countries, nations, uh, religions, any large group. Um, we approach conflict, um, understanding conflict and conflict analysis from a multidisciplinary approach. That means things like political science, social psychology, religion, uh, legal aspects, different ways of understanding why there are conflicts. In the first semester, you have a course in each that outlines what the, what is, the theory has to tell us about why there are conflicts. Um, because our lecturers are mostly, um, oh, I got to admit someone, hold on. Because our uh, lecturers are mostly people who are in the field in different types of positions, um, you not only get theory, but you also get experience. How does theory really match practice in the field? What really happens? Um, and uh, along with that, we really focus on the practical skills that you as students would need to know in order to solve conflicts. Because how do you solve conflicts through learning skills of negotiation, mediation, facilitation? So in the first semester, you have a course, actually two, because you have a mediation workshop following the first semester in what do you need to know, how do you negotiate, and how do you mediate. The second and third semester are a series of much more um, multidisciplinary uh, electives where you choose what you want to learn. And they could be things that are like um, international, more like international development or uh, uh, supporting people in uh, situations of conflict. Uh, they might be issues of leadership or of course on the environment different ways of mixing the political, sociological, psychological, economic, legal, all of those aspects in different ways. Um, that's more or less the, at least the, the academic side of the program. Um, along with that, we really focus on what each cohort is interested in. So that's what I'm, some of you have already been in, in, interviewed. Why I focus on what your interests are, because for each uh, cohort, we try to get uh, guest speakers or workshops or um, some sort of experiential uh, um, situations that we can involve you in that are aligned with your interests. And in the program, kind of skipping ahead to a whole other section, we get people who are from a wide variety of backgrounds of interests. So we get people from political science backgrounds, social psychology or, meet or law, and just as varied as they come in, they go on to do very interesting things. We'll get into that actually on the slide about where people work today. Um, but our goal in the program is really to train you as much as possible and give you as many experiences in what you're going to be interested in and hopefully working in the future. Um, that's the short version of the program. Um, so I'm going to open it up soon to questions because I think questions are way more important. But I also want to introduce uh, Alexander Zaslav, who's on the, who's here in the Zoom, I was going to say on the call, who's in the Zoom presentation, and she is a student from two years ago. She also did a thesis in the program, there is a thesis option, and I have to admit someone, I'm done. Um, and she is here and can you by questions which are much more appropriate to former students. So I could keep talking, but I'm kind of boring, and I don't want to bore you. 
Uh, do you guys have any questions? Let's start with that. Plus, I want to talk about uh, what the situation with COVID-19, which some of you have already spoken to about, but for some of you, this is going to be new. Um, but I'd like to go to Alex just to see if you have anything you'd like to add or say. Is there anything I missed? Um, no, I think just that uh, you touched on it a bit, but that you're studying with an international cohort, I think is a big deal. I know Absolutely. for me it was because you're studying about conflicts, but you have perspectives from people really all over the world. So how I look at things versus how my Chinese classmate versus my Peruvian classmate, um, I think that was a big thing for me in wanting to do the international masters was having the different perspectives in the classroom and then pursuing it in Israel, I think also was a, a big thing because you're living sorry, you're living in the conflict, you're, you're feeling it, it's much more tangible. And so you have the chance not only to learn within the classroom, but also um, be engaged in the city and learn within the environment. So I feel like those would be two more big things for, for major benefits of the program. That's it. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I think, it, I think just as interesting as our lecturers are, so are our students. We have students, not just from a wide variety of, of of uh, work or um, education backgrounds but people from around the world and that always really does it contributes to the classroom because for example my favorite is in um for example in courses that look at the difference between a democracy and an autocracy and have students who actually come from different systems and see uh those systems in very different ways and i think that's you get a lot of benefit out of it yeah. or you'll be learning about negotiation and cross-cultural approaches to negotiation while you're actually negotiating with people with those different approaches. So it feels very much like you're already engaging what you'd be doing in the field. Okay, so like, let me go back to this other slide because this has more information on it. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's open this up to questions. Does anyone have a specific question? And I don't know if I can see can I see, let's do it that way. And I don't know, how do I see chat? Hold on, because I'm on a... The chat's on the bottom. Yeah, I know, but I just moved it, so now I can't see it at all. Hold on. I'm not sure if anyone chatted. Oh, my screen sharing is paused. Okay, so I'm guessing I have no chats. Okay. So let me speak about the situation with COVID-19 because that's, I think, is huge. Um, normally, uh, you'd arrive in October and the, uh, the program goes until uh, usually August. Some people end up finishing in the semester. People stay on for the summer semester and study until August. But because of the situation with COVID, uh, we, the plan is that we will be staying in the classroom. We hope that stays. Um, for, for students this year who are in the program this year, they, this whole spring semester has been online on Zoom, and only in the summer are they coming back um, in small groups. And we hope it remains that way in October. Uh, the, we also assume that. Um, there are going to be countries where it'll be difficult to travel uh, to get to Israel, depending on what's happening in October. So we make sure that it will be on Zoom, even if we're in the classroom, so people will have a chance to be able to, to log on during the classes uh, uh, as we're uh, being taught, and also record all the classes for some reason we miss them. But the idea is that eventually you're expected as soon as you can to get on a flight and come to Israel. Um, and we will deal with all situations as they happen, including we expect we normally do a lot of class trips and um, uh, and uh, we do an orientation trip. So we're going to do that as much as possible. In the event that certain trips have to be made, we actually have to trips. Which opened a whole other thing that's interesting. Um, a whole other area of being able to 
places that we're not even allowed to go to, including places in the West Bank or in maybe Gaza. We're going to try and organize that inside Gaza in any or what they're going to do. We're going to see what we can do. We already have somebody loves, knows well, who's organizing an Easter Jerusalem and uh, running a virtual trip into areas that um, would be very difficult to get to, even as you as tourists. Um, and for us, with all the university bus, it would be more difficult. So we're going to see. We're going we're gonna to do a few of those as well, just for just for the It'd be really interesting to, to learn. Um, does anyone else? Does anyone? Have a question? I have uh, one question. Sure. Go ahead. Um, um, so, according to the during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, does does that do, it, if I was to if I, when I apply when we uh, after applying in for the 2020 2021 year mm -hmm. does that mean that does that does that mean that the 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 sum the 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 or the fall uh, semester and the the first semester and the second semester are the the lectures are done on on Zoom and then if they, the lecture. The lectures will be done on Zoom for as long as required or whenever required for anyone who can't get into Israel. We've committed to that. So if you're, for some reason, you can't get from the UK to Israel because there's a travel ban or flights are difficult or whatever the reasons are, um, we, we commit to being online for as long as you need that. The, but the expectation is that this is a program where you're, you're meeting in person, so eventually we will meet. That's the idea. Thank you. Yep. Got to admit somebody. Okay. Uh, other questions? And most of you have spoken to already. Hi, Marcelo. You're... Hi. Oh, you're back. Hi, we can hear you now. How are you? Yeah, yeah, fine. Thank you. Okay. Where, where are you zooming in from? Sorry? Where are you? I'm going to zoom. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay, very nice. So, um, you guys have must, must have more questions. I can go back to the presentation and I can go through that as well. Hold on, which one is this screen? This one. Okay. I'll speak very, very quickly about these slides because I hate presentations, but let me at least bring up a couple of things that you might be interested in. Um, okay, well, first of all, can you see the presentation now? Okay, I hate Zoom. Okay, so first of all, there's lots of programs at Tel Aviv University. You should know that. There are 30,000 uh, students in total and what does the thing say? Sorry, it's in the way. Something like 2,000 international students. Ah, hold on. And 2,000 international students. So I'm trying to keep you guys centered and still do this at the same time, and it's not working. OK. Um, so there are other programs as well. Why do I mention this? It's not because I want you to go to other programs. Um, you can if you want. That's fine. Uh, that in the second and third semester, we have a series of electives, but we also provide electives from other programs as well. Um, so not all programs share electives. We do our best to have at least uh, one or two electives from each of the other programs. Uh, we can't guarantee anything, but we really do our best to try to do that as well. So you can be uh, a part of another program to at least take a course or two. Plus in our courses, we have people from other programs as well, because I think it's important that you guys um, hear other voices as well. Uh, in addition, Tao International has what's called the Student Life Team. Uh, they are a series of counselors who help you guys acclimatize to Israel, deal with any issues you might have. Let's say you need to see a doctor um, or you need to find an apartment. Um, or we've had situations, this is my favorite, where people in the dorms were having arguments and we would get conflict resolution students to help out, <laughs> to negotiate between them. Uh, but we also have the counselors who also help out. So there is a support team for people 
who, because we recognize that you guys aren't Israeli, you don't necessarily speak Hebrew. Uh, so there's a team of people from Tao International who help out for that as well. Um, anything else I should mention on here? I think I mentioned all of this. Um, I think also jumping, Corey, like I compared for us also in the program, compared to the other programs even, like there's obviously the uh, Tao team, but Corey and, and Yonit, who's not, not on the call, but um, I'm sure Corey will touch on, they were also this very supportive team. So it didn't feel like you were here on your own. So also from an academic perspective, if you need to tailor your classes, find internships, and even as alumni now, they still help us um, identify job opportunities um, and other opportunities to engage. I think also there's something specific in this program, even with Intel, because I was looking at multiple programs, that this program was much more um, kind of interested in providing you a holistic experience, both academically and outside, and there was a big support. So that was just my... Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, we figure that you're coming to Israel, and I'm Canadian originally, and, and Yonit, who couldn't be on the call tonight, she's the uh, student uh, um, uh, academic support person, um, she, she's American, and we know what it's like to be new in a place, and it's not easy, and you guys are maybe cut off uh, culturally and by language, because it's a different culture, and there's different languages here, so, but we, and you came here to learn and to experience things. So we try to give you guys as much of those experiences as possible, which is really important. I studied, just to give you a little bit of information about myself, I studied public studies at University of Ottawa in Canada. And I had already lived in Israel and I went to Canada to, I returned home um, for a couple of years. And one of the things that I found missing from studying in at least North America is context of, and the emotions of conflict. Um, it's very difficult to learn from somebody who hasn't really been in a conflict. Uh, it's interesting and the theory can be great, but unless you're experiencing what it's like to live in a situation of, of uh, where, where conflict is emotion, because that's a lot of conflict, um, you, you, it, it's different. It's if you really want to understand conflict, you need to learn in conflict, uh, in a surrounding of at least a safe conflict. And we try to provide you with as many of those experiences as possible. And I think that's that's an important aspect. Let me just see. We went through that. Uh, okay, so I was going to talk about career opportunities. And just as I said, we have people who come into the program from legal background or uh, um, social psychology. I'm trying to think of the big ones. Uh, social psychology, political science, international relations, sociology or history. Those are the biggest ones that I remember. Um, they go on to do some really interesting things. Um, actually, I'll even back up. So there are some people who come from the arts, or there are some people who come from business. Um, Alex is from the arts. That's, why, <laughs> that's also why I'm... But every year we have one or two. Um, or business, or economics, or, um, or people who, for example, studied something completely unrelated, and then went off to do some program in Central America, and realized that they were lacking the skills on how to cope with with dealing with communities and conflict. And when they come into the program, we try to train them as much as possible for them to go out to, into the world to learn, uh, to, to, to work in these areas. Um, and a lot of our students end up in, and this is, this is more or less by um, rank in order, um, things like government or the NGO, uh, international uh, uh, idea world, nonprofits, uh, think tanks, being a consultant, or then they go on to do a PhD or, or go into law school or something similar. Um, those are, are the most common uh, paths of people. And if you go on our website, um, we actually have, I gave a few examples of people when they came into the, before they came into the program, uh, during the program, what they learned, and then after the program, what they did, whether they were, went on to learn something else or if they went on to work. But, uh, they're very common paths, um, and I, I keep track, uh, Yoni and I keep track, oh, somebody else is coming in, hold on, uh, Yoni and I keep track of where people came from and where they're going, um, and what they do uh, after. So we know how best to provide you guys with uh, a good education. And part of that is actually, uh, Alex touched on it, um, is having an alumni, a group of of 
people who've been in the program. Uh, we have a database of where everyone is, what they're doing, what they're working in. We connect people. So, for example, um, it's a bit difficult in an international program with people around the world because in each place we maybe have three or four people. But there are a couple of clusters. So, Washington, D.C. has turned into a big area where we now have, I think it's 18 uh, uh, graduates uh, in the last couple of years who are in Washington, D.C. And they've been helping each other find jobs and uh, network with each other. Israel is another one, so a lot of people come on the program and then end up staying in Israel for a couple of years. So we also have a good um, base in Israel of people to, to, to connect to each other so they can network. And then we try to provide, so in D.C. and in Tel Aviv, we try to do some alumni uh, get-togethers um, every so often. Hard to do in COVID-19, but let's hope we're able to do it right after. Um, but it's a good way for people to network and find out what other people are doing in either work in similar or maybe really different areas. Um, questions? No I have questions. one question. Oh, go ahead. Um, um, regarding the thesis, uh, doing up, uh, um, writing a thesis, mm -hmm. um, how 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 does the how, how what is the process of of the thesis option writing a dissertation? Sure. Okay. So the degree is a standalone degree. You get the degree whether you write a thesis or not. The thesis is an additional year, and how do you apply for the thesis? Is your it depends on your GPA. We're actually uh, trying to figure out. We might have to. Uh, uh, um, raise the GPA because we have to be in line with the entire school. Um, so we're having that discussion about next year. But the idea is you have to have a, a minimum specific GPA in your first semester in the program and then maintain a specific GPA after. You have to have a, a research topic, which is that you think that's easy. That's actually the hard, one of the hardest parts is having a topic um, or, or deciding on a topic. And that can be, it doesn't have to be you know exactly what you're going to do, but it has to be a good um, uh, a sense of what you want to research. And it can change, but you have to have a good sense. And you have to find an advisor who is willing to, to work with you, which is also a little bit difficult. But that's something we work with you and advisors to try to match you guys up. Alex also wrote a thesis. Alex, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think the, so the thesis is not required. and. I think for the thesis, basically, it's it's really an individual commitment because you're doing it on a second year on your own. And there's a few other people, usually a handful of people that decide to stay on. And you have kind of one course that helps you in preparing your proposal. But other than that, it's on yourself. So it's really deciding, is this something that's going to, um, that I'm so passionate about that I can, you know, write for a year about this? And is this something that's gonna benefit me? So obviously if you wanna do a PhD, then it's critical to have a thesis. Or for me, it, it pertains to the work that I was doing in the field and I wanted a thesis on a specific topic. Um, but it would probably be for one of those two reasons that you'd want to, um, you'd, you'd really have to be engaged with it because it's a lot of, the, the program itself is, um, you know, very much a communal feeling. Everyone's, especially the first semester, you're all engaging in the same courses. Um, you're engaging things inside the classroom, outside the classroom. So the thesis can be really interesting and it taught me a lot that was outside of um, more in researching, but you have to be very committed to the subject, I guess would be my advice. Yeah, it, it's, I'd say it, it's, it's from, from experience of other feedback and from what we see. It's hard. A thesis is a really hard uh, thing to do because you're, you're all on your own and your advisor, their job is not to check up on you. Your, their job is to make sure you're on the right path and it's really up to you. So that's something we warn you guys. We're, we're very good at warning you guys about all these pitfalls um, because it's, it's, it's a year commitment. It's not a lot of money, but it's a year commitment and a lot of work and we want you guys to succeed. So uh, we, we, we like to prepare our students for what they're about to get into. So, yeah, but this, that's a discussion, you know, when you're in the program, we have actually meetings on this. So. Also, when you're in the program, you kind of understand from like the, your longer papers that you're writing, is there something that from that you think could build into 
into thesis material. So it's not like you have to come into the program being like, ah, I'm ready to write a thesis. I know what it's about. Yep. You'll get the idea as you go. Absolutely. Okay, and now some of you have already applied and some of you haven't, but just so you know, uh, application, we say the application deadline is July 31st. That's pretty much true. And the reason is we can technically accept people after that, but it's much more difficult to get visas in September than it is in August. So that's why um, if for people in Israel, I don't know if there's anyone on the call who's actually in Israel, it's in, until September-ish is, uh, is, is our real deadline for that. But for people outside of Israel, I would say um, you should apply by July 31st. Um, and it also be aware that for those applying, you have, uh, yeah, applying from now, um, the dorms are, the deadline for the dorms comes up in a week. So you're not going to make that unless you already applied and were accepted and confirmed. Um, so uh, you'd have to find a place to live on your own unless there happens to be places in, left in the dorms. Now, in previous years, that doesn't happen. But this coming year, because of COVID-19, we don't know. We don't know how many people. So for example, normally there is an overseas program that comes in January and they save a bunch of rooms for them. We don't know if that's gonna be happening. So we don't know for sure about the dorms, but it's something we could let you know if it's still of interest in, in September. But the other thing to know, because most of you are not um, uh, living in Israel, uh, is to uh, understand that part of the deadline issue is that in September, everything shuts down for a month uh, because we have a series of Jewish holidays. So from a September, I think it's the 20th this year until October, I can't remember, it's, almost, it's about three or four weeks. Uh, most things shut down, including we're, we're still online, uh, Yonit and I are, but even the university, there's a lot of things we can't get done because most of it shuts down during the holidays. So just so you know. Uh, in terms of the application requirements, what do you need to know? It's all on our website. Just go on the website on the how to apply. It's very simple. Um, and if you have any questions, you you can write me, you can write Unite. Uh, that's easy. The cost is here, uh, 16,800. We do have scholarships. There's and, and I would say if you are in need of scholarships, then apply sooner rather than later because um, we have a couple of a new scholarship that just came, uh, COVID-19 scholarship, meaning to encourage people to, to come during COVID-19 from the university. They actually saw that this was going to be an issue for international students. So they are strongly, um, uh, they're trying to uh, entice people to come to Israel. Um, plus, we are being very understanding about scholarships uh, as much as possible in our program and trying to be, uh, to free up some money as much as possible. So. That's it. And then for those who are American, there's also um, FASFA, there's a series of loans, American style loans. Um, and that's it. Did Marcelo have a question? Yes. Oh, sorry. And yeah, now I can't see anybody. I have to go back to this. Let me stop sharing. Yes. Now I see you. Yes. Marcelo, uh, Marcelo? did you ask something? Marcelo, do you have anything? I, I, we can't hear you. No, the explanation very good. The, uh, I couldn't understand the, the, the explanation is okay. But no question for now, no, at moments. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then Mark is asking, um, Alex asking you, what are you doing in your career now? What other programs did you look at before deciding on Tel Aviv uh, University? Okay. So I'll start with programs before. Um, I was looking, I think there were a few programs in, in Israel that looked at conflict, one in, in Hebrew University and one in Haifa. And I looked at other programs in Tel Aviv University. And um, I think like I was saying before, actually in the process of applying where I was really receiving the most feedback and most information from was from Corey and Unit. And I, I felt like that was a very important thing if you know, you're know you starting this master's program. And maybe I was also more used to it coming from an American university, but having that that support network, I think is a really critical thing in this. And I feel like Corey and Unit were very invested in the students and, and 
building a program around our interests. And so that's why I ended up um, choosing the Tel Aviv University uh, conflict resolution masters. And then what am I doing now? So after, uh, after the main year, I did a thesis track. And while I was doing the thesis, I was working, um, I was a program coordinator for a initiative that uses arts and dance specifically as a um, tool for cross-cultural encounters. And so I was helping um, run that program. And now I just joined a, another nonprofit called Hand in Hand. And it's basically a network. Um, in Israel, the school system is, is segregated based on um, ethnicity and religion. And so it's the only network of integrated and bilingual um, schools for Jews and Arabs to study together. And so I'm working uh, there as of the last few months. And I think you know, for me, it was a big career transition. I came from the arts, but then I wanted to use the arts um, more in the field of conflict resolution. And so what Corey talked about, about this first semester that you get this very broad uh, introduction to these different perspectives on conflict and approaches to conflict was really what I wanted in terms of gaining the knowledge in the field. And then the second semester, I was able to tailor my electives more to, um, to courses that were, were practical, whether that was uh, facilitation or advanced negotiations, um, or there's an internship practicum where you can get an internship in the field. And a lot of what I learned during that time has helped me then as I um, work to create projects. And even actually today, I was creating a presentation that was sort of to give my team the background on on peace building perspectives. And a lot of that's taken from what I learned in the master's and the thesis. So I'd say my, and I'm in Israel, by the way, sorry. So I stayed in Israel and these nonprofits I'm working with are in Israel. So the program kind of led directly to where I went after. You didn't mention the social hackathon that you organized. Ah, the hackathon. Okay, so <laughs> then I have like passion projects. So um, I think the biggest thing for me was when I was in the studies was that I wanted, um, when, when we're studying in this field, there's, there's not so many opportunities to basically take what we're learning in the classroom and put it to action. And um, a lot of times in internships also, sometimes you know you're doing more busy work, but, but then when you go suddenly, I felt when I was working in the field versus studying the field, okay, wait, suddenly I have to create a project, I have to create an idea to solve an issue. And so um, I created an initiative that Corey and Yumi helped support as a program for the um, conflict resolution masters and the students in this current year's cohort, and we're hoping to continue it. But basically, a hackathon, which is a creative solving, a creative problem solving platform that's often used in tech and engineering. But the idea is how can we um, engage with each other and think creatively about new solutions, basically simple solutions to complex problems. And we wanted to target that around the nonprofit field. And so we just finished, it ended up being a digital hackathon because of Corona. But there are many students from this year's cohort and um, previous cohorts that took part and they helped a nonprofit basically develop um, strategies for digital education. And so that's my side thing, but still keeping me connected to the program in terms of, um, of how as students and young professionals in the field, can we, uh, really create something tangible, create ideas um, to influence this, the field and create social impact. That's that. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Any other questions? I'll let you guys go. I've got one. Oh, go ahead. I've got one question um, regarding the uh, regarding uh, the, the 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 course. Uh, what 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 are the essentials? The essential requirement that there's or is there a particular essential requirements? Like for instance, um, uh, legal studies, uh, some knowledge on legal studies or is it base is it is it universal to any degree that i've done that a person's done before it, it, it can be universal to any degree but i would say because you're going you're going to study social sciences having um or you 
we're in social sciences. So having some background in social science courses or humanities, it's not that far off, um, it really is really, really helpful. So we've had people who came from areas that were very, very unrelated and didn't take many social science courses in their undergraduate degree. And you could see that they would struggle with how to write papers in social sciences. Now you have a course which helps you research methods, which helps you um, learn how to do research and in social sciences and a little bit, a little bit how to write. Um, but I, I, I have noticed that. So people who came from very unrelated uh, areas, sometimes would, it would be a little hard. It would be difficult, some of the courses. So for example, I remember uh, uh, there's a political science course on the first political approaches to conflict. And some people would really, really struggle with how to understand political science because they'd never taken a course in something related. Um, it doesn't mean you can't, it's, it's not that you can't, you won't be accepted, um, but we recognize that people might struggle and you have to understand, okay, so this is the other thing that I didn't say, but normally when I'm interviewing people, uh, and I, if you're taking seven academic courses in the first semester, which is a lot, it really is a lot. And so if you don't have a lot of background in something similar, and it doesn't have to be in law or in uh, political science or in social psychology, because you, we, we fill in the gaps of what you need to know, but it really is a lot. And so you have to be, understand that you're taking on um, a lot of work and you might struggle. And there are people in every uh, um, year who struggle with some course, um, uh, usually different courses. Uh, plus, I would say that I, this is uh, um, for people who English isn't their first language. Also, everything's in English. Um, so some people, for example, this is common. We've had people from Finland tell me this and Mexico saying they had to do all their readings twice because, you know, it takes time to get used to studying in a different language in a totally different um, uh, academic uh, um, subject. So, um, if you're prepared for it, and if you really are willing to put in the work, then we're, we're here to support you. Um, but it's, it's really up to you guys as students to do that. There's meaning your master's students, your adults, well, there's only so much we can give. We can give you resources, but uh, we can't really, you know, there's not much we can do. You have to fulfill the requirements of the, the program. If you're struggling, for example, with some subject, that happens. And it happens with people from all different backgrounds. It's not, you know, I'm not trying to, I don't want to pick on any one background, but it happens all the time. But it is learning, if, if you know, like for instance, my, myself, I know uh, I, I'm multilingual. So I know Hebrew, uh, English, Arabic, uh, 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 German, uh, uh, Italian, a little bit of Amharic. Does that help? with the with the course uh, the, doing not really no i mean it helps if you're in israel and then you get to speak all the languages around you yes but not uh, for academically not necessarily i don't know alex do you have an opinion on that all the courses are taught in english so so no i it's just um like english based but i mean i guess it, talking about registering for other courses. I don't know if that's a possibility, Corey, but if you want to then register for a course, Hebrew in speaking, Hebrew. it's not part of TAU International, so I don't know. But if you wanted to do like an internship, I think then it's helpful because then, um, I don't know, if you speak um, Hayek, then you can go do an internship in um, African uh, ARDC, I'm African. Anyway, there's a lot of different organizations that you could use as languages or Arabic and Hebrew, obviously. It's more beneficial if you have those um, tools, but for a regular coursework, then, then no, it's all in English. And I would say just because there's two South Americans and I know uh, Tamir speaks um, Spanish and Marcelo, you could at least probably understand Spanish. There's actually a, a Spanish speaking uh, population here of uh, in, in South Tel Aviv of people who, um, who moved to Israel, who for, for, I don't know if they're refugee status or not, but there's, there's a couple of organizations that try to help out people who are Spanish speaking. Um, yeah. And so it, kind of any, any background or language is always helpful when you're dealing with internships. The more skills you have, obviously the better in, in terms of an internship um, or your experiences. In the classroom, it's less, it's more about listening and, and um, taking part in the classes. 
I have one little question. Sure. Yeah, so I'm in Honduras right now, and apparently we don't have an Israeli embassy. I am starting to apply for a visa, student visa. And the closer one to me is in Guatemala. And they've told me that all processes for a student visa are paralyzed at this point. Mm. So should I wait until further notice, or is there any movement I can do until now? Um, well, we, we, we also have not been told anything about visas. We actually have a, a meeting about it with all the international programs in a week or two. Uh, we assume at some point they're going to start. I mean, as you know, uh, Tamir, specifically, in Israel, things are very always last minute. Nobody's planning months ahead. Um, but, so it will happen. Uh, what I would suggest for everybody, if you, this is an issue with, let's say, the Israeli embassy, is to keep checking back every few, every few weeks. And as soon as we know something, we will definitely send out uh, a notification to everybody uh, who's, for example, for visas. Sometimes we are not told. That's another thing that's very Israeli. So it's always just good to, to check in anyways. Um, the plus side of all that is really uh, never knowing what's going to happen is they will organize your visa very, very quickly in the end. Um, as you, uh, as it, it just always is that way. That's one great thing about Israelis. For example, when we had, because of COVID-19, when we had to go online, the university organized it in three days. Um, and when they realized that the system they were using was not good, it wasn't Zoom, it was a different system, they organized Zoom in three more days. And that was it. And then we were, we were all done. And I've heard of universities in Germany, and still, they couldn't organize themselves in months. So I, I don't know how true that is. I was just told this by people in, in different programs. Um, so Israelis are very good on the fly. Sometimes planning months ahead, not so great, but we're doing our best to try to push them to at least let us know, um, you know, when you can expect, for example, when you apply for a visa, that sort of thing. So yeah, we, we have our, we definitely have our finger on that because we know how important it is. Okay, anyone else? Okay, well, if anyone thinks of anything, uh, just send uh, us an email at the program, either for, to me or Yonit. Uh, by that, you just go on to our website, which will be, uh, I think, I think uh, uh, David is going to add this at the end of the presentation, because it'll all be online at, at some point, this, this recording. Um, and so there'll be a link to our website, very easy to find and very easy to contact us. And we usually get in touch with you within a day or two maximum. It's usually a couple of hours, but um, we're, we'll get in touch with you with any uh, uh, questions you might have. Okay. Hey, David, we came back. <laughs> I just heard my name, so I switched my camera on. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Okay. You're right. Okay. So, so I think we're done. Unless anyone else wants to say anything. Thank you, Alex, for, for taking part. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, and also, oh, I, I should say this. If anyone uh, has any questions for former students, uh, we can connect you to either Alex or somebody else. I can find a student who has a similar background or is thinking if you have a similar idea of what you want to do in the future, I can connect you with the student as well. We do that all the time.